Uh, thank you uh, for sticking around for our last session, uh, and uh, very happy to, uh, to have Tom Kalinske, uh, one of the most uh, memorable characters of the game industry, uh, uh, who had uh, many, many exploits as the president and CEO of uh, Sega of America. Uh, and uh, as Brian mentioned, he's now the uh, chairman of Gazillion, the maker of uh, Marvel Heroes 2016. Um, uh, very, very interesting place in the industry again. Uh, so, if, if you could take us back and look back a little, uh, what, what do you think were some of the most important accomplishments you had at Sega? By the way, thanks for having me here, Dean. I've, uh, after being out of the industry for 20 years, I think I've learned an awful lot in the last few days, so thanks, thanks for inviting me. Well, you know, it, at Sega in 1990, when I, when I joined the company, I think the most important thing I initially did was, was form the right team. And some of the people were already there, and then we brought a lot of people in. And, and by the way, uh, on diversity, six of our top 14 executives were female in 1991 in the video game industry. Think about that for a second. Um, but we had a, we had a problem. <laughs> Nintendo had 98% of the market. That's a pretty big problem. And uh, they controlled retail, they controlled third parties, uh, third parties and retailers were afraid if they helped Sega, maybe they wouldn't get their cartridges shipped or maybe they wouldn't get the hardware shipped for retail shelf space. So it was a difficult uh, issue. And what we had to do was attack the problem in a different way. And so we left Nintendo with the, what I would call the kids market, uh, the, the seven to 15 year old market. And we went after teens and college age kids. And we didn't have the money Nintendo had, so we had to be clever in our advertising and do the Sega does what Nintendo don't. And uh, uh, welcome to the next level. And we made fun of Nintendo in our, in our advertising, which they really appreciated. And, uh, and uh, eventually we started gaining on them. Uh, we also did grassroots marketing. We had a, a college kid on a lot of campuses who was a good gamer. We'd give him Genesis hardware and then send him software, and all we wanted back was for him to walk around the campus and talk about how wonderful Genesis and Sega was. It was a pretty unique insight in those days to, to think that uh, games uh, and the cartoon world uh, that they represented were for more than kids, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we ended up passing Nintendo in share of market in 93 with a 52% share of the market. And our Game Gear unit actually for a while passed in dollar share uh, Game Boy. So uh, the, strategy, the strategy worked, but it wasn't, it wasn't me. It was me challenging the team to come up with unique strategies, do mall tours, uh, compare our product against Nintendo's, and, and let people vote, openly vote. And we usually would get about 80% of the votes, so that worked pretty, pretty well for us. Sponsor rock concerts, have expert game players playing with people watching, kind of a precursor to, to uh, uh, game contests. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, why did you uh, rejoin uh, in the industry here as Gazillion's uh, chairman? So I, I actually, um, Dave Dorman, who's the CEO now of, of, of Gazillion, and I, our, our children played Little League Baseball together, our sons. And so I got to know him, and you know, you get pretty close to other parents in Little League. And, uh, and we started talking about the video game industry. And actually, a few years ago, uh, Dave and Nolan Bushnell and I tried to buy a game company and get back into the game business. And we weren't successful at that, but we stayed close to each other. And so when he became an investor in Gazillion and then uh, became CEO, he asked me to go on the board. So I've actually been on the board for almost a year. And then the current chairman, um, it had to go out of the chairman's role, and so they asked me to come in as chairman, and I was happy to do so, because I think it's a great company, it's a great game, and a great team, much like Sega was in the early days. Mm -hmm. So you've got that Marvel Heroes license. Uh, what are some moves Gazillion has to make to, to keep yeah, growing? Good, you know? good, good question. Obviously, you have to keep improving. You have to keep improving the, the, the game, and I think that's being done. Uh, certainly the, the download time is much better than it used to be. Uh, getting into the game, is, it really getting into it is easier. I always say if you, if you don't hook somebody in the first five minutes of a game, you're going to lose them. Well, now you can play with significant characters right away, and that makes it all that more interesting. But other things that the company has to do, you can't just have one product. We've got to have more products. We've got to get on consoles. We've got to get in mobile. We've got to start learning about, uh, and we are learning about AR and VR. Uh, so all of those things, I can't talk about the specifics yet because we haven't revealed them, but there's a lot going on that's gonna change the company dramatically. 
So uh, what are some uh, difference, differences between the, the game industry back then and, and now that are so noticeable to you? Lot, lots of differences. I could probably talk a long time on that. I'll try not to. Um, <laughs> so the one, one big difference, of course, is the size of the industry back in the 90s. When I first joined, was a, the whole industry was maybe $4 billion. And of course, today we heard about it being $100 billion. Well, it, the movie industry was $25 billion back then. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned to you a little while ago, and we tried to start doing a rating system. I went to Jack Valenti, head of the Motion Picture Association, and I said, let's use your motion picture rating system on video games, because we're a form of entertainment. And he scoffed at me. Video game industry? You guys aren't important. Why would I want to do that? It tarnished my, my rating system. So that's how people thought about us. And, the, and you, as you know, the Senate was worried about video games addicting children and teens and was going to hurt their grades. None of that happened. It was all, all, all nonsense. But we didn't, they didn't know it back, back then. And, and again, the dominance that Nintendo had, it was all cartridge games that, toward the end of my time, CD-ROM. But still, you couldn't change the game. You had to make a game that was as close to perfect as you could. And, and, and it was going to be very difficult to change it later on. You could do another edition of it, but you couldn't change it on the fly the way you do now. There was no internet. Retail was all important. The big retailers controlled uh, the, in the industry. So lots and lots of differences. We had no E3. Can I tell my CES story? Yeah, yeah sure. So in 1992, at CES in Las Vegas, you'd walk in and you'd see the computers, the nice new stuff, and you'd see the phones, and you'd see the, the television screens, and you, then you'd walk past the porn section, which I didn't quite understand why that was there, and then you'd get to video games way in the back. And that particular year, it was worse than in the back, they had us out the door, and they had a tent. It was raining in Las Vegas. And the rain was dripping down on my Genesis hardware. And I said, that's it. This is the last time we ever come to CES. We're going to form our own show. I was at that show. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were. And so we got together with uh, EA and Larry Probst and Activision and, and uh, Bobby Kodak and, uh, and Acclaim and a few other guys. Oh, and Sony only made software then on, and basically on our system. And we decided we're going to do our own show. We're not going to CES anymore. And we invited all the retailers to our own show. And they loved it. And so that was what evolved into, well, a lot of things happened. That evolved into E3, but it, it also, because of the rating issue on Mortal Kombat and Night Trap, it evolved into the Senate hearings, which made us form a, uh, a better industry association and then a, a formalize a rating system under Dr. Pober. And um, the rest is history. So you went outside the industry as well. Um, what, what did you learn there uh, that you think can be applied to games? Yes. So I, I left in 96. I was actually hired by Mike Milken and Larry Ellison to run something that became called Knowledge Universe, where we were, we were using technology to improve education of all ages, young kids, middle-sized kids, college kids, adults, IT training. Uh, and we formed, 30, we formed or bought 36 different companies. A lot of them we started from scratch. And, and so this is a tough end. I learned that the, the ed tech business is a, is a tough business. Now, we were, people would say, much like some have said around here, that, oh, it's hard to invest in, in, uh, in video games. Well, it was hard to invest in ed tech and expect a good, a good return. And yet it did happen. You know, many, many examples of that. Uh, I think by the time we were nine years later, we were done with Knowledge Universe. We we had revenues over two of our different companies totaled over two billion dollars. Leapfrog at one point was 680 million, and we were using uh, video tech technology to deliver young kids reading and math curriculum to help them learn better, faster, um, in a more intriguing ways. So we had a lot of success, and there have been other companies that have had success. But I think the lesson was you, you needed a lot of patience. Cutting edge technology didn't work right away. It took a lot of time. You needed proof, much like we need proof here. The proof in the education world, particularly in schools, is you need like three or four years of research proof that that particular math game actually raised the, the level of understanding of math. And that's hard to do. You know, it takes you two years to develop, and then you've got three years of research before anybody really wants to invest in you. So uh, I learned that these companies had to have really clear vision, really clear goals, 
short-term one-year plans with definite milestones, a unique strategy. If your strategy is the same as everybody else's, you're going to fail. Uh, and, and, and to be realistic about how are you going to protect your investors' investment. And so those were some of the things I think from the ed tech industry we, are still applicable to the video game industry. Uh, so uh, you did uh, sort of keep this foot in it as a, a venture partner at Alsop Louis, uh, the venture capital firm, and you, you made some game investments as well. Yes, I, I, I am a, a venture partner at Alsop Louis. Uh, some of you know Gilman Louis was the founder of Spectrum Holobyte, and they made some, some great uh, simulation games and other games long ago. Uh, and then he went on to InQtel, the CIA's arm into Silicon Valley. But w as a, as a uh, VC firm, we invested in something that used to be called Justin TV. Some of you here know that's Twitch TV. We led the A round in Twitch TV and very happy with all the folks at Twitch and, and very happy with the outcome selling to Amazon for almost a billion dollars. But we also were an investor in, uh, in Niantic. We're, we're the only VC that is in Niantic. And so the reporter yesterday said there's no VCs in Niantic. We're in Niantic, and needless to say, we're, we're extremely happy with the progress that John has made, and Gilman Louis is on the Niantic board of directors. So those are the two we've, we've, we've done so far. So uh, what do you think of Pokemon Go then? And uh, if you were launching Sonic Go, how would you do that? <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> so I, I, I love Pokemon Go. I, I, I think this is, it, it's the perfect, I mean, you know, John talked about it yesterday. It's the perfect marriage of virtual reality and a great license, a 20-year property that started as little collectible characters and then was a card game and then was a, was a series of video games and then television shows. And all those characters, I think there's 720 actually total or something like that. Uh, what an opportunity to, to, to get up off your feet with your, your son or daughter and wander around and explore and find these things and collect them and, and uh, brag to your friends how many you've collected. Uh, I think it's just a, it's a marvelous product, a marvelous game. And, and they haven't even started, I don't think, um, trading yet, have they? Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunities for, for them for the future. So needless to say, I mean, somebody yesterday mentioned it was worth $3 billion now. Well, we at Al Saflu would be very happy if that's true. So, uh, um, you know, uh, we've got augmented reality there, um, virtual reality, video games. What do, what do you see for their future? Well, you've had a lot of discussions that are far more capable of talking about that than, than I am. But remember, I was a proponent of virtual reality and AR back in the 90s. And I worked with Jaron Lanier, one of the pioneers in, in, uh, in VR back then. We had a Sega headset, and we came close to bringing it out. We had a couple games developed for it. But there was one big problem, as was mentioned yesterday. The processing power wasn't good enough. And if you had this thing on for more than a few minutes, some people would either fall over dizzy and literally fall down, and others would get sick to their stomach. So obviously, we couldn't bring this, this product out. So for me to see what's going on now, people were saying, gee, it's not good. I think it's fantastic. I mean, I'm really in, in, enthralled with what already is being done. And I can imagine a lot for the future where, as someone was mentioning yesterday, you can have a contact lens on and uh, a controller. Well, I don't think you'll need a controller. You'll need voice recognition. You can be talking to some button somewhere and control the game with your voice or with a controller. And this is going to lead to wonderful experiences. Imagine running down the Grand Canyon, uh, chasing something, and, and seeing the grandeur of the Grand Canyon while you're chasing this thing, or biking through the streets of Paris or Berlin or London and uh, in some kind of gameplay, or finding a, solving a mystery in the Louvre. And my point is there's going to be a lot of educational experiences as part of VR that's not even the intention of the game, but makes the game more interesting and, and is certainly the, is going to be good for everybody. So you, you do think there's a lot more that we can do with uh, uh, making uh, education uh, much more game-like, I guess? Or? Yeah, I mean, this is one of my, my ongoing passions. I'm, I'm still chairman of something called Global Education Learning. I'm on the board of Cambium Learning Group. I'm on the board of uh, a, a company called APL, which is an education company. Uh, and, and a few others, and, and what we're trying to do is use video game technology to make curriculum more interesting and involving and intriguing for both children, teens, and, and, and adults. And I think we're making a lot of progress. I think we made progress at, at, at LeapFrog. 
Uh, you see ABC Mouse now has a, a valuation of a billion dollars. Uh, Toka Boca was just purchased by Spin Master. So that's in the young kids area. In the little bit older kids area, you have, you have uh, 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 DreamWorks, uh, not DreamWorks, Dream, <laughs> Jesse Willie Wilson's company doing math. Uh, education that's in a video game format and it's really effective for teaching algebra and higher math principles. Um, you see, you see uh, both Pearson and Houghton Mifflin, Mifflin now using video game technology to embed in, their, in, in the curriculum. So they get the curriculum developed and then they try to make it fun and interesting, which is what I believe needs to be done. And then they collect the data and they can personalize that curriculum to each student, which is another Something we know how to do in the video game industry. We can change a game depending on the level of understanding the player has. Well, we can do the same thing with students today in curriculum. I think that's really important. So, so gaming is a $100 billion industry now. Um, there's bigger industries. It's not as big as it could be. I mean, what, are, what is your hope? Uh, you know, for like an inspired future uh, for video games? Well, I, I think this is a great industry. I mean, we've come so far in the time that I've been involved in from being disrespected to being, I think, now respected and with an understanding that, that, that students who are involved, and almost everybody is who's a student involved with video games, is, is going to do better in STEM courses, is going to be do, doing better in math. And, and uh, in science and, and engineering and also in programming and learning how to code. There are tremendous interest in that area. So I, I think the, uh, the video game industry is, is now very respected. Maybe a lot of people don't understand the value of the art form that we have, that this really is an art form. Uh, but certainly impact on society. What a great industry for millennials to join. Millennials want to be part of an industry that gives back, that does something good. Well, here we are. We're, we're a wonderful industry for that, and I think we have so many opportunities for growth and so many opportunities outside of the United States that this can easily, in the next five years, be triple the size that we are today. So I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about the future of this industry. I'm glad to be back involved in it. I'm glad to be helping Gazillion. Hopefully I can help Gazillion grow. Uh, and also just to interact with the rest of you. It's been a great experience for me. Thank you, Tom. Um, so does anybody have a, a question out there for Tom? I can't uh, see. We've got this time for a question. By the way, you could all read Console Wars and really hear the whole history of mm -hmm. Sega versus Nintendo. That's an awesome book. Um, is that going to get turned into a movie as well? Something yeah. Like um, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg have the feature film rights, and supposedly they're working on the script, but I hear Seth's kind of busy these days. <laughs> uh, and Sony has the distribution rights, and Scott Rudin has agreed to produce it. Scott Rudin did Moneyball, Social Network, uh, uh, Captain Phillips, uh, Budapest Hotel. He won two Tonys a few weeks ago in, in uh, New York for plays that he was involved in. So he, he's uh, going to produce it. There's also a documentary that's been mostly finished. I'm, I'm actually in the documentary a lot. And uh, that it will be released at the same time as the feature film as some part of the marketing help for the, for the feature film. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we're, we're going to archive this on YouTube. You can be a star on YouTube as well. Oh, that's even better. Tom Kalinske. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>